second time in as many days, one of Trump's attorneys has gone on Fox and in the best passive aggressive style possible, she has threatened one or more justices of the Supreme Court that they had better rule in his favor in the 14th Amendment and presidential immunity cases because Trump put them there. Alina Haba, she did it again Wednesday in the afternoon last night in prime time. The message is loud and clear, and God knows with the utter corruption of the conservatives on this Supreme Court, you could never convict anybody of doing anything wrong. But this is either an illegal threat against Justice Brett Kavanaugh and the others, or it is the back half of an illegal quid pro quo by Brett Kavanaugh and the others. I think it should be a slam dunk in the Supreme Court. I have faith in them. You know, people like um, Kavanaugh, who the president fought for, who the president went through hell to get into place. He'll step up. Those people will step up. The corruption, the cynicism, the perversion of justice, the disdain for America so great that you don't even try to hide the fact that you're expecting a justice of the Supreme Court to vote against the Constitution and against the democracy because the case involves the corrupt and festering animal who appointed him to it. This was so obvious that even this idiot Alina Haba realized she had better steer out of that skid just in case. And she did that immediately. He'll step up. Those people will step up, not because they're pro-Trump, but because because they're pro-law, because they're pro-fairness. And the law on this is very clear. There is nothing to prosecute here, but there is everything to publicize here. This is the fourth time in one week that Trump has gotten this message out to the three justices whom he appointed to the Supreme Court and to the other three conservatives who were already there urinating on the Constitution the day he got there. The message is they had better find in his favor on these two critical cases headed their way. A week ago today, Maggie Haberman, went on CNN and vaguely quoted Trump without characterizing her sources as being worried that the justices might be too worried about appearing fair, that they might rule against him just to make themselves look good. And then on Tuesday, another Trump attorney, Christina Bob, went on the streaming channel Real America's Voice and said, quote, it should be the entire nation who determines who they want for president, whether they're guilty of insurrection or not. It's up to the people. That can be read not just at minimum as an admission of Trump's potential guilt as an insurrectionist, but more importantly, it is a blatant warning to the Supreme Court to the entire judicial system, to the nation, that Trump would not recognize any decision to enforce the 14th Amendment, to declare him an insurrectionist, to remove him from the ballot. And under those circumstances, the only way Trump would wind up in power would be by armed violence. If it's up to the people whether they're guilty of insurrection or not, that is no longer in the realm of an election. And Wednesday... Alina Haba had continued the theme on Fox, as I mentioned, confirming first last week's Haberman report and then adding, quote, I can tell you that Trump's concern is a valid one. Republicans are conservative. They get nervous. They unfortunately sometimes shy away from being pro-Trump because they feel that even if the laws on our side, they might be swayed much like the Democratic side would be right. So they're trying so hard to look neutral that sometimes they make the wrong call. There's no politics that should be involved in this. It's simply American, unquote. Even for Trump, this is astounding and alarming. And it has now, last night, been escalated one more evil notch with Haba insisting that Kavanaugh would step up. First, she mentions that Trump went through hell to get him on the Supreme Court. Then she insists that's not why he would rule for Trump. Well, if that's not why he would rule for Trump, why did she mention it? These are uncoded messages. 
blatant warnings to the justices that regardless of the law, they are expected to act on Trump's behalf. It is putrid. It is vile. It is Trump. And if the messages do not come back reassuring Trump or when, as assumed, the court turns him down on presidential immunity to provide itself with cover for vetoing the Constitution and not enforcing the 14th Amendment, we have to be ready for an all out assault on the justices and on their safety and on their existence by Trump himself as he has shown with Judge Engeron in the New York business fraud case and with Judge Chutkin in the Washington election subversion case. Trump has no respect for the Supreme Court, no respect for any court, and certainly no respect for the lives or the safety of the justices or the judges. And it is essential for the Biden administration and the Biden campaign to saturate the advertising platforms with reminders that Trump is already right now presenting vivid previews of his full-throated dictatorship, where the rule of law will be erased and replaced by the rule of threat and coercion and quid pro quo. There is more to discuss about this Alina Haba. She made an earlier appearance yesterday in which she underscored her top tier role in this Trump idiocracy. But first, to the still low chance, but nonetheless intriguing possibility that trouble waits for Trump in New Hampshire. In the New Hampshire Republican primary, 18 days from now, newest poll, Trump 37, Haley 33, Christie, 10, so Trump up by only four. Caveats? Last month, the same pollster had Trump up by four. And he has them both going up four points since then. More caveats. The pollster is American Research Group. And American Research Group has a really bad track record and a really long, really bad track record, even just in New Hampshire. And American Research Group is based in New Hampshire. Two days before the 2000 Republican primary, it had Bush beating McCain by two. McCain won by 18. More caveats. The logo of American Research Group, I swear they used the printer I bought for my first Apple Macintosh in 1986. And its website glitches. It keeps reloading. Still... 37-33, Trump could be wrong by 10 points and still be only Trump 42-28, which is roughly where the 538 poll of polls has it. Trump 42, Haley 29, Christie 11. And the first meaningful part of that is there is Trump vulnerability. If Christie dropped out, his voters might scatter among DeSantis and Ramaswamy and Haley, but they would not be going to Trump. The other meaningful part of all this is New Hampshire polling is clarifying just who is who in this race. Haley, she is the acceptable face of fascism, the alternate for Trumpists who are worried that their cult leader might be in prison or fully insane or, I don't know, dead by Election Day. She has already promised to pardon Trump. She has already, intentionally or not, said she was comfortable with the good old Confederate States of America, and she won't be bringing up any of those pesky issues of skin color or immigration, despite her, you know, self. She is also obviously the spoiler. This ARG poll says only 63% of likely New Hampshire voters are Republicans. The other 37 are undeclared. They could be independents, they could be Democrats, and they break 36-29 for Haley. But clearly, Haley is now the Trumpists' break glass in event of emergency candidate. And New Hampshire Republicans seem to be a lot closer to actually pulling that alarm than those in the other states do. Christie, he is obviously the choice of conservatives with consciences, and you knew that the moment that the number 10% came up, didn't you? DeSantis, well, he is the winner of the Rudy Giuliani Memorial Self-Destruction Prize, and Ramaswamy, who day before yesterday declared Trump was damaged and predicted they would make sure he would never be elected again, he has only realized far too late that that could have been his lane all along. 
The New Hampshire polling also indicates that the most stunning part of the Republican world, this crazed mixture of fantasy, violence, authoritarianism, racism, and really stupid people, is that it seems to be slightly more worried about the prospect of being chained to a metaphorical corpse of a candidate in Trump than it is about the prospect of being chained to an ever increasingly insane and thus perhaps unelectable candidate in Trump. Haley is there in case someone or something removes Trump from the election. If that does not happen, Trump can be literally speaking in tongues by the time of the Republican convention, and they will not abandon him. And every day, he gets a little bit closer to speaking in tongues. At 9.30 yesterday morning, Trump posted, quote, The invasion through our southern border is for purposes of voting in the 2020 election, unquote. Voting in the 2020 election, you say? Even in MAGA world, that would be a neat trick. Moreover, about six hours later, Trump reposted the same damn thing. The invasion through our southern border is for purposes of voting in the 2020 election. No correction, no stupid excuse that the cultists would lap up. I meant to write that. And they'd say, see, I told you the 2020 election was fixed. They're still counting votes against him. Once again, right now, Trump does not know where he is. He does not know who you are. And increasingly, he does not know when it is. And by the way, between his two warnings about 2024 migrants voting in the 2020 election, Trump made 31 posts in one hour, all of them insults and or threats against E. Jean Carroll, and he says he is going to testify 11 days from now in the damages phase of the lawsuit that she's already won against him, as opposed to the second defamation suit she has against him. And if it was not obvious that what is left of Trump's brains are oozing out of his ears, the idea that he should take the stand in a rape case he has already lost should confirm that. Happily, Trump is surrounded by legal geniuses who would never let something like that happen. And when I say never, I mean always. And when I say geniuses, I mean Alina Habba, Christina Bob, and now Harmeet Dillon. Habba is back with her dumbest moment yet. She is the Trump attorney who Wednesday gently threatened the six conservative Supreme Court justices that they had better not be trying so hard to look neutral in the 14th Amendment and presidential immunity cases. She's that lawyer, as opposed to Bob, who is the Trump attorney who Tuesday gently threatened the justices and everybody else that it doesn't matter if Trump is guilty of insurrection and ineligible for the presidency because the American people will have the final word and they will install him anyway, presumably by violence. No, this is Haba. Haba went on one of the three million pro-Trump podcasts, PBD, and she managed to score a 10 out of 10 on not one, but two different delusions of grandeur. I'll tell you something. Somebody said to me, Alina, would you rather be um, would you rather be smart or pretty? And I said, oh, easy, pretty. I can fake being smart. (laughs) Well, no. No, you can't. I don't know if she just confessed she isn't smart and she's trying to fake it, or if she actually thinks she's smart and also self-deprecating. But one day, as we have just lionized Robert Oppenheimer with his own film, we will also honor... Professors Dave Dunning and Justin Kruger in a combination scientific biography and buddy film in which we are shown how they proved that stupid people truly think they are smart and smart people truly cannot believe that there aren't lots of people as smart or smarter than they are. Either way, 
Somebody will have to play Alina Haba in that film because the Dunning-Kruger moments explode from her cortex like Trump posts about E. Jean Carroll. You have to be honest. It doesn't hurt to be good looking in this world, in the PR world, on TV. It doesn't hurt. Mm. And when you're good looking, that's great. But it can also mean people think you're stupid or people think that President Trump hired me because I was good looking. That is absolutely not the case. Finally, she's right. People do think she's stupid. And clearly, Trump did not hire her because she was good looking. He hired her because you just can't have too many parking lot law experts at your beck and call. Incidentally, as she said these things, Miss Haba was dressed in a Cruella de Vil outfit, only the kind you would find at Ross Dress for Less. And no, I, I know, she is not as important as, say, the first Biden campaign ad that sticks a toe into the waters of the real meaning of this election, democracy or dictatorship or of Biden's speech today. And she's also not as important as the House Oversight Committee findings about how many millions Trump took from foreign governments while president, both of which stories I will get to presently. But Alina Haba is invaluable in one way, as a reminder, both of what we are up against and more happily, of what Trump is up against. In 21st century America, stupidity will get you a long way. But eventually, that stupidity, Bill Barr trusted Trump? Trump trusted him? Trump knew Brad Raffensperger would break the law for him? Eventually, that stupidity will be someone's downfall. Because unlike the rest of us who wonder if there is somebody smarter out there, or somebody more evil, or just somebody more prepared these thoughts never cross Trump's mind, nor the minds of his various Alina Habas. Thus, the last 10% of the scheme, whatever it is, is left to chance because they cannot conceive of anything they do going wrong. Because they are them. And none of them, not one can answer that first question of mental health correctly. Can you approximately accurately say how you are viewed by all the people around you? This is what Alina Haba, who when pressed explained that how good looking she thinks she is has helped her in her fields, being on TV and being in public relations, not one word about, you know, lawyering. This is what Alina Haba, who is on television or online every day, every day working for a creature who in one hour can send out 31 posts disparaging a woman he raped, who puts out more videos online than I do. This is what Alina Haba thinks everybody thinks of her compared to what everybody thinks of the special counsel. They love having pressers. They love having press conferences. Jack Smith, they love having press conferences, getting in front, having their moment. It's almost a narcissistic. As special counsel, Jack Smith has had two press events. Neither was a press conference, a presser. He has read two brief statements. He has never answered nor acknowledged any reporter's question. Jack Smith has 16 associates and deputies in his office. None of them has ever held a news conference nor answered a reporter's question. And bluntly, I don't know if that number 16 is correct, because other than Thomas Wyndham and Molly Gaston, as I researched that number, I didn't recognize any of the other names of Jack Smith's deputies. Haba is not just wrong about this press conference stuff. Not just stupid, but unless she is knowingly and deliberately lying, she is actually hallucinating. By the way, new 14th Amendment lawsuit filed in Illinois yesterday trying to get the State Board of Elections there to block him from both the Republican primary in March and the general. I'm sure Alina will deal with it as soon as she finishes her 
acting exercises. I can fake being smart. <laughs> <laughs> Of more substance but less novelty, what we all knew we knew has now been confirmed. During his presidency, foreign governments funneled at least $7,800,000 through Donald Trump's bribery glory holes, the Trump Washington Hotel, the Trump Las Vegas Hotel, and the Trump towering inferno of ego around the corner from me here in Fun City. And 5600000 of that came from China. China bought its share of Trump's presidency for $5,600,000. The Democrats on the House Oversight Committee who have the receipts and who actually show them rather than pretend to hide them, they showed them. And those are the numbers about just Trump's foreign violations of the emoluments clause, as presented by Jamie Raskin in a news conference on Capitol Hill. All of the numbers gleaned from the documents from Trump's former accounting firm, documents which were subpoenaed when Democrats still had the majority in 2019, and which even with the success of Trump's henchmen on the committee to sabotage that subpoena and the lawsuit to enforce it, even despite them, the Democrats have managed to get a portion of those documents from the accounting firm. So $7.8 million in payoffs to Trump. 5.6 million from China alone. Those are floors. We sometimes forget amid the insanity, the dictatorship, the depravity, the disloyalty to this country and the hot and cold running immorality that Donald Trump is also a whore, that his administration was a whore house and that those who worked for him there were at best the procurers NBC News provided an unintentional punchline to this sordid, if unsurprising, story. Quote, Trump's 2024 presidential campaign did not immediately reply to a request for comment, unquote. To which the only possible response is, did you remember to write it in Chinese? And the start of Wabbit season has been moved up a day, and President Biden will launch the full frontal attack on Trump, the would-be dictator, today at Valley Forge. Because of likely bad weather there over the weekend, he was to speak on the third anniversary of the January 6th insurrection, which is on January 6th. All indications are that the campaign's attitude towards how best to remind the voters or explain to the ones not really paying attention of the unprecedented threat of a deranged, amoral, vengeful, not quite human animal running for dictator. The best way to do that is to roll it out slowly rather than to hit them with it all at once. Thus, the president's speech may not even mention his opponent by name, either of his names, Trump or baby Hitler. It may be more on the lines of what we saw in the first Biden ad on the topic, which dropped yesterday and which will not knock you out, but which does get the point across. I've made the preservation of American democracy the central issue of my presidency. I believe in free and fair elections and the right to vote fairly and have your vote counted. There's something dangerous happening in America. There's an extremist movement that does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy. All of us are being asked right now, what will we do to maintain our democracy? History's watching. The world is watching. And most important, our children and grandchildren will hold us responsible. The Vice President and I have supported voting rights since day one of this administration. And I ask every American to join me in this cause. America is still a place of possibilities where the power resides with we, the people. That's our soul. We are the United States of America. There is nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. And I'm Keith Olbermann, and I also approve this message. Again, if that was the closing argument ad against Trump, guess what? President Biden loses. But it's not. I fully expect the naming of names and the clipping of clips as we've done here in the silly way that I do it. The promise to be a dictator, the quotation of Hitler, the talk of terminating the Constitution, the threats to the Supreme Court justices. Uh, the rest of this list a little long. It's the Internet. We only have infinity. I can't get all 5,000 possible Biden ads about Trump 
listed for you here. The ultimate goal is to drive Trump and his cult back into their sewers, and you do as much as you need to do. But in the end, I think it is essential to remember that whatever angle works should be used. Biden commercials about the resurgent economy, Biden commercials about Trump admiring Hitler. Yes and yes. And buy two spot availabilities in the same commercial break. So you hit each angle in a span of two and a half minutes. Spots about January 6th. Spots about the Republicans holding Ukraine hostage. Spots about Trump using the immigration issue rather than doing anything to try to solve it. All of it. Make 175 different spots. Just as all the methods that can be used to stop and destroy Trump must be utilized, despite any squeamishness about the long-term consequences. When I hear got lucky once dilettantes like David Axelrod say that enforcing the 14th Amendment would rip the country apart, I wonder exactly what he thinks will happen to the country if Trump prevails. I guess, David, it wouldn't be ripped apart. It would just be torn apart. That make you feel better? I'm going to invoke the movie Oppenheimer again. You have to do it. You have to build the bomb. You have to be ready to use the bomb. I am as anti-nuclear weapons as anybody could be. I am also from a time when Robert Oppenheimer was still alive. And from when my father reminded me that when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima... It was eight days after he had turned 16 years old. And that was the first time it dawned on him that when he turned 18 years old, he might not be drafted to fight in World War II because it might be over by 1947. Later, the English teacher who shaped my understanding of literature and writing mentioned in passing that when that bomb was dropped, he was in the army, two years ahead of my dad, 18 years old, and he was in training, and what he was in training for was the land invasion of Japan. I don't want the consequences of a man removed from the ballot by criminal conviction or by the enforcement of the 14th Amendment or by anything other than voting. I don't want them but I will take them because cleaning up whatever tantrums the Trump cult throws is immeasurably better and easier and frankly less disastrous and bloody than the revolution that would have to be staged to remove Trump and his cult from the dictatorship they seek and plan. Also of interest here, so that RFK Jr. Super PAC celebration to be headlined by Andrea Bocelli and Dionne Warwick and Martin Sheen. Well, one out of three ain't bad. Actually, one out of three is bad. Kennedy's people lied. Two of those three headliners deny having ever said they would do anything of the kind. But, you know, actually, it ain't bad. Being right 33% of the time, that's like RFK Jr.'s high watermark this century. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. Come on, Countdown, a century ago, literally one century ago, something happened in Columbus, Ohio, and it would have fit right next to all the headlines this week about the Epstein files, because it was something that actually didn't happen a century ago in Columbus, Ohio, and it proves two things. The writings of James Thurber are as topical today as they were when he wrote them, and... 
People have always been willing to believe nonsense. And the more impossible, the more stupid it is, the more nonsensical it is, the more likely they are to believe it. The explanation coming up on Fridays with Thurber. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze worse, Elon Musk. Lonnie has sued the National Labor Relations Board trying to end its authority to, you know, protect workers from, you know, slime balls like Elon Musk. I'm assuming the Politico.com headline for this story was unintentionally funny, but who knows? Quote, Musk's SpaceX seeks to blow up federal labor enforcer, unquote. Well, sir, if there's anything you can depend on Elon Musk and his SpaceX rockets to do, it's blow up. Worser with the silver American Values 2024, the Bobby Kennedy Jr. Super PAC. It tweeted out a Daily Mail article quoting, well, the American Values 2024 Super PAC, saying that the singer Andrea Bocelli would be performing at a California event on January 22nd to raise funds for the Robert F. Kennedy Jr. campaign, and he would be joined there by what they termed well-wisher guests, including Martin Sheen and Dion Warwick. Ms. Warwick was the first to call Kennedy's people out for lying about her. Quote, I don't know anything about this event. I did not agree to it, and I certainly won't be there. Yesterday, my old friend Marty Sheen, who has stationery and a fleece bearing a logo reading the acting president of the United States, he issued a statement through friends reading, I do not endorse RFK Jr., nor will I be attending his party. I wholeheartedly support President Joe Biden and the Democratic ticket in 2024. Sincerely, Martin Sheen. So two down, one to go, Mr. Bocelli. Not only does this fiasco add to Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s reputation for being unable to separate his fantasies from reality, but just to confuse him a little more, one of the people who tweeted out Martin Sheen's denial was the actor Bradley Whitford. When Sheen played President Bartlett on the West Wing, Whitford, of course, played President Bartlett's chief of staff, Josh Lyman. But the winner, the worst... Will Weissert of the Associated Press. Sometimes in our troubled years, the journalistic both sidesism that may yet destroy this country is subtle, or it's self defensive, or it's stuck in the middle of so much material that is at worst mediocre that it's hard to find or hard to fully perceive. And then there is this story about tomorrow by the National Political Reporter of the Associated Press, Mr. Weissert. In the story, there's this quote. With Biden and Trump now headed toward a potential 2020 rematch, both are talking about the same event in very different ways and offering framing they believe gives them an advantage. The dueling narratives reflect how an attack that disrupted the certification of the election is increasingly viewed differently along partisan lines and how Trump has bet that the riot won't hurt his candidacy, unquote. Oh, here we go. January 6th means different things to different people, like, you know, mass murder does. Man's worst inhumanity to man, or a means of easing metropolitan overcrowding. Or there's the subject of lying, the root of all evil, or an efficient way to avoid uncomfortable silences. Mr. Weissert's article veers back and forth from paragraph to paragraph between the supposed Biden view that the January 6, 2021 attempt to overthrow the government was, you know, bad, while the Trump view was it was a beautiful day And the GOP view is now that the Democrats are overreacting because, you know, a president goading a mob to attack the U.S. Capitol and kill the Speaker of the House, that happens after every election. Well, nearly every election. Well, okay, it never happened before this, but it's happened one in a row. 
It's possible Will Weiser did not write the headline accompanying his piece of crap story, but I also haven't seen him quitting in protest over that headline, and bluntly, he should. Or he should get fired. Or he should just go to some other line of work. Like, I don't know, packaging bullshit and selling it at some gardening store. Here's the headline. Associated Press. Makes me proud to have worked for United Press International. Associated Press, quote, One attack, two interpretations. Biden and Trump both make the January 6th riot a political rallying cry. Will Weissert of the Associated Press. Hey, Will, look at it this way. If the democracy dies next year, you will have written the epitaph that we can put on its tombstone. You, sir, are today's worst person in the world! Even in the context of the Associated Press! Not every James Thurber story still holds up, but for a surprisingly large percentage of them, the point of the story is as topical now as it was when he wrote it or when it happened. When it happened, which in this case is the year 1913. The Day the Dam Broke is from his essential masterpiece, My Life and Hard Times. And if it is about anything, it is about people believing and acting upon nonsense. In the face of science, in the face of common sense, in the face of you could just ask somebody, they will almost always avoid those solutions and choose instead to believe whatever the hell they want to believe. Which results in things like... The Day the Dam Broke, by James Thurber. My memories of what my family and I went through during the 1913 flood in Ohio, I would gladly forget. And yet neither the hardships we endured, nor the turmoil and confusion we experienced can alter my feeling toward my native state and city. I am having a fine time now and wish Columbus were here, but if anyone ever wished a city was in hell... It was during that frightful and perilous afternoon in 1913 when the dam broke. Or, to be more exact, when everybody in town thought the dam broke. We were both ennobled and demoralized by the experience. Grandfather especially rose to magnificent heights, which can never lose their splendor for me, even though his reactions to the flood were based upon a profound misconception, namely that Nathan Bedford Forrest's cavalry was the menace we were called upon to face. The only possible means of escape for us was to flee the house, a step which Grandfather sternly forbade, brandishing his old army saber in his hand. Let the sons of come, he roared. Meanwhile, hundreds of people were streaming by our house in wild panic, screaming, Go east! Go east! We had to stun Grandfather with the ironing board. Impeded as we were by the inert form of the old gentleman, he was taller than six feet and weighed almost 170 pounds, we were passed in the first half mile by practically everybody else in the city. Had Grandfather not come to at the corner of Parsons Avenue and Town Street, we would unquestionably have been overtaken and engulfed by the roaring waters. That is, if there had been any roaring waters... Later, when the panic had died down and people had gone rather sheepishly back to their homes and their offices, minimizing the distances they had run and offering various reasons for running, city engineers pointed out that even if the dam had broken, the water level would not have risen more than two additional inches in the west side. The west side was, at the time of the dam scare, under 30 feet of water as indeed were all Ohio River towns during the great spring floods of 20 years ago, the east side, where we lived and where all the running occurred, had never been in any danger at all. Only a rise of some 95 feet could have caused the floodwaters to flow over High Street, the thoroughfare that divided the east side of town from the west, and engulf the east side. The fact that we were all as safe as kittens under a cook stove did not, however, assuage in the least the fine despair and the grotesque desperation which seized upon the residents of the east side when the cry spread like a grass fire that the dam had given way. 
Some of the most dignified, staid, cynical, and clear-thinking men in town abandoned their wives, stenographers, homes, and offices, and ran east. There are few alarms in the world more terrifying than the dam has broken. There are few persons capable of stopping to reason when that clarion cry strikes upon their ears, even persons who live in towns no nearer than 500 miles to a dam. The Columbus, Ohio broken dam rumor began, as I recall, at about noon of March 12, 1913. High Street, the main canyon of trade, was loud with the placid hum of business and the buzzing of placid businessmen, arguing, computing, wheedling, offering, refusing, compromising. Darius Cunningway, one of the foremost corporation lawyers in the Middle West, was telling the Public Utilities Commission in the language of Julius Caesar that they might as well try to move the Northern Star as to move him. Other men were making their little boasts and their little gestures. Suddenly, somebody began to run. It may be that he had simply remembered all of a moment an engagement to meet his wife, for which he was now frightfully late, Whatever it was, he ran east on Broad Street, probably toward the Marimore restaurant, a favorite place for a man to meet his wife. Somebody else began to run, perhaps a newsboy in high spirits. Another man, a portly gentleman of affairs, broke into to a trot. Inside of 10 minutes, everybody on High Street from the Union Depot to the courthouse was running. A loud mumble gradually crystallized into the dread word, damn, the dam has broke. The fear was put into words by a little old lady in an electric or by a traffic cop or by a small boy. Nobody knows who, nor does it now really matter. 2,000 people were abruptly in full flight. Go east, was the cry that arose. East, away from the river. East to safety. Go east. Go east. Go east. Black streams of people flowed eastward down all the streets leading in that direction. These streams whose headwaters were in the dry goods stores, office buildings, harness shops, movie theaters, were fed by trickles of housewives, children, cripples, servants, dogs, and cats, slipping out of the houses past which the main streams flowed, shouting and screaming. People ran out of homes, leaving fires burning and food cooking and doors wide open. I remember, however, that my mother turned out all the fires and that she took with her a dozen eggs and two loaves of bread. It was her plan to make Memorial Hall just two blocks away and take refuge somewhere in the top of it in one of the dusty rooms where war veterans met and where old battle flags and stage scenery were stored. But the seething throngs shouting, Go East! drew her along and the rest of us with her. When Grandfather regained full consciousness at Parsons Avenue, he turned upon the retreating mob like a vengeful prophet and exhorted the men to form ranks and stand off the rebel dogs. But at length he too got the idea that the dam had broken and roaring, Go East! In his powerful voice, he caught up in one arm a small child and, in the other, a slight clerkish man of perhaps 42. And we slowly began to gain on those ahead of us. A scattering of firemen, policemen, and army officers in dress uniforms, there had been a review at Fort Hayes in the northern part of town, added color to the surging billows of people. Go East! cried a little child in a piping voice as she ran past a porch on which drowsed a lieutenant colonel of infantry. Used to quick decisions, trained to immediate obedience, the officer bounded off the porch and running at full tilt soon passed the child, bawling, Go East! The two of them emptied rapidly the houses of the little street they were on. What is it? What is it? demanded a fat waddling man who intercepted the colonel. The officer dropped behind and asked the little child what it was. "'The dam has broke!' gasped the girl. "'The dam has broke!' roared the colonel. "'Go east! Go east! Go east!' He was soon leading, with the exhausted child in his arms, a fleeing company of 300 persons who had gathered around him from living rooms, shops, garages, backyards, and basements. Nobody has ever been able to compute with any exactness how many people took part in the great rout of 1913 for the panic, which extended from the Winslow Bottling Works in the South End to Clintonville, six miles north, ended as abruptly as it began, and the bobtail and ragtag and velvet gown groups of refugees melted away and slunk home, leaving the streets peaceful and deserted. The shouting, weeping, tangled evacuation of the city, 
lasted not more than two hours in all. Some few people got as far east as Reynoldsburg, 12 miles away. 50 or more reached the country club, eight miles away. Most of the others gave up, exhausted, or climbed trees in Franklin Park, four miles out. Order was restored and fear dispelled, finally by means of militiamen riding about in motor lorries, bawling through megaphones, The dam has not broken! At first, this tended only to add to the confusion and increase the panic, for many stampeders thought the soldiers were bellowing, The dam has now broken! Thus setting an official seal of authentication on the calamity. All the time, the sun shone quietly, and there was nowhere any sign of oncoming waters. A visitor in an airplane looking down on the straggling, agitated masses of people below would have been hard put to it to divine a reason for the phenomenon. It must have inspired in such an observer a peculiar kind of terror, like the sight of the Marie Celeste, abandoned at sea, its galley fires peacefully burning, its tranquil decks bright in the sunlight. An aunt of mine, Aunt Edith Taylor, was in a movie theater on High Street when, over and above the sound of the piano in the pit, a William S. Hart cowboy picture was being shown, there rose the steadily increasing tromp of running feet. Persistent shouts rose above the tromping. An elderly man sitting near my aunt mumbled something, got out of his seat, and went up the aisle at a dog trot. This started everybody. In an instant, the audience was jamming the aisles. Fire, shouted a woman who always expected to be burned up in a theater. But now the shouts outside were louder and coherent. The dam has broke, cried somebody. Go east, screamed a small woman in front of my aunt. And east they went, pushing and shoving and clawing, knocking women and children down, emerging finally into the street, torn and sprawling. Inside the theater, Bill Hart was calmly calling some desperado's bluff, and the brave girl at the piano played row, row, row loudly, and then in my harem. Outside, men were streaming across the state house yard. Others were climbing trees. A woman managed to get up onto the These Are My Jewels statue, whose bronze figures of Sherman, Stanton, Grant, and Sheridan watched with cold unconcern the going to pieces of the capital city. I ran south to State Street, east on State to 3rd, south on 3rd to town, and out east on town, my Aunt Edith has written me. A tall, spare woman with grim eyes and a determined chin ran past me down the middle of the street. I was still uncertain as to what was the matter in spite of all the shouting. I drew up alongside the woman with some effort, for although she was in her late 50s, she had a beautiful, easy running form and seemed to be in excellent condition. What is it? I puffed. She gave me a quick glance and then looked ahead again, stepping up her pace a trifle. Don't ask me, ask God, she said. When I reached Grant Avenue, I was so spent that Dr. H.R. Mallory, you remember Dr. Mallory, the man with the white beard who looks like Robert Browning? Well, Dr. Mallory, whom I had drawn away from at the corner of Fifth and Town, passed me. It's got us, he shouted, and I felt sure that whatever it was, it did have us, for you know what conviction Dr. Mallory's statements always carried. I didn't know at the time what he meant, but I found out later. There was a boy behind him on roller skates, and Dr. Mallory mistook the swishing of the skates for the sound of rushing water. He eventually reached the Columbus School for Girls at the corner of Parsons Avenue and Town Street, where he collapsed, expecting the cold, frothing waters of the Scioto to sweep him into oblivion. The boy on skates swirled past him, and Dr. Mallory realized for the first time what he had been running from. Looking back up the street, he could see no signs of water, but nevertheless, after resting a few minutes, he jogged on east again. He caught up with me at Ohio Avenue, where we rested together. I should say that about 700 people passed us. A funny thing was that all of them were on foot. Nobody seemed to have had the courage to stop and start his car. But as I remember it, all cars had to be cranked in those days, which is probably the reason. The next day, the city went about its business as if nothing had happened. But there was no joking. It was two years or more before you dared treat the breaking of the dam lightly. And even now, 20 years after, there are a few persons, like Dr. Mallory, who will shut up like a clam if you mention the afternoon of the Great Run. The Day the Dam Broke by James Thurber 
I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on the guitars, the bass, and the drums. Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, were arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2, written by Mitch Warren Davis, courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our satirical and pithy musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend Jonathan Banks from Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad and Airplane. And everything else was pretty much my fault, as always. That's Countdown for this 302 days until the 2024 U.S. presidential election and the 1095th day since Dementia J. Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States three years ago tomorrow. Use the 14th Amendment, the Insurrection Act, and the justice system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is Monday. Until then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck. I can fake being smart. (laughs) 